Well, it's sure good to see you guys today. Are you happy today? Yes. Yes. Happy to be here. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you're having a good day or not. Because good days are based on motion, and motion kind of changes with the wind. And so, even if you're having a terrible day, you know what you need to do? Smile. And praise the Lord. Because the guy next to you doesn't care if you're having a bad day. He just needs you to be a blessing to him, right? And the same for you. If the person next to you looks at you and says, the government's all gone awry. <laughs> I know that. I don't need you to tell me that. But the thing is, people need to be uplifted. Amen. So when we come to church, what do we do? We smile. And we say, God is good. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look into the book of Galatians again today, Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts in whatever way we need the most. Father, we just look forward to the day when you come. But until that day, Father, we ask that you will keep us faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our passage today, Paul contrasts the false gospel, which is salvation by works of the law, against the true gospel, which is salvation by faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the central issue that Paul is addressing in his epistle to the Galatians. It is the battle between the true gospel that Paul preached and the false gospel that the Judaizers were preaching to the Galatians. As we study this passage, which is Galatians 3, 10 through 14, I pray that it will become totally apparent and clear that these two roads to heaven, salvation by law-keeping, and salvation by faith can never meet in partnership for they are two totally opposite methods. Now, did everybody get a sermon handout? Anybody not have a sermon handout? Oh, we have one. We got one, Don? I'm out. Oh. All right, we got it covered now. Thank you very much. No, we will be following. We'll be following along, and the sermon handouts are just nice to have because you don't have to go hunting through your Bible real quick. And of course, I'm going to go by you faster than that. So, sermon handouts you just follow up right, right, straight down. You know, these two methods of salvation are mutually exclusive. So the moment you accept one, the other one becomes of none effect. And vice versa. So our choice means everything. Having said that, now we'll look at a little more detail of the scripture and we'll notice that the key argument that Paul raises in this passage is the argument of scripture itself. So we, we notice earlier in Galatians he used different, different things to point in the same direction. Today he's going to use scripture. Now what was scripture in Paul's day? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. So that's what he's going to be looking at. And you'll notice several texts that he uses from the Old Testament. For, of course, that was the scripture of his day. And pointing out what he was defending, which is salvation by faith alone. Sometimes we think, oh, Old Testament, that doesn't, that doesn't teach salvation by grace. Just the New Testament. No, no, not really. Listen here to what verse 10, and I have placed 
two translations in your notes. You have the New International Version at the top, and then you have the New King James Version. And the reason that I put these in there is the, the NIV says the same thing as the New King James, but the New King James gives it just a little more kick. He's, it's a little worded a little more forcefully. And, and as you probably already know, that's exactly what I believe that Paul, that's how he wrote this book. He wrote it with passion. He's doing battle. He's fighting against something. And so he says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is who? Everyone. Everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Hmm. In, in the NIV, it says exactly the same thing, but I believe, like I said, the New King James put, gives it just a little more kick. Look at verse 11. What does the word relies mean? Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the, the righteousness will, righteous will live by faith. What does the word relies mean? Depend on. Depend on. Anything else? Trust in. Mm -hmm. The word relies, the way I looked at it, was depending on for salvation. That's what that word means. So we can re read it. Clearly no one who, who is depending on the law for salvation is justified before God. When we rely on our law keeping to save us, we are wasting our time because law keeping does nothing. It does not contribute one iota to your salvation. Then we see in verse 13 that there is a curse on everyone who depends on their law keeping for salvation and fails to live up to the law in every detail, in thought, word, and deed. <clears throat> How are you doing? Are you following every letter of the law in thought, word, and deed without fail? Deuteronomy 27, 26. What's the first word? Curse. Curse. Curse is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out. And then all the people of Israel said what? Amen. Amen. What does amen mean? Amen. So be it. We're going to do it. You got it, boss. We got it covered, right? So how'd they do? Well, the next thing you know, they're dancing around the cow. After the amen. Why did God give them the law and why did the people respond? Amen. God knew that they couldn't keep the law. He wasn't surprised. But God wanted to open their eyes to the fact that they were sinners powerless to keep the law of God. That they were totally dependent on God for their salvation. You may be thinking, why would God curse somebody for trying to be good? Do you parents curse your children when they try to do good, when they're trying to do what's right? No. Paul, in his own way, is saying that if you want to go to heaven, the issue is not whether you are being good. The issue is that if you want to try and the law-keeping method, 
You must keep that law perfectly, continually, from the day you're born till the day you expire. You have to keep it perfectly. The problem comes when we realize that no one has been able to do this except one. And who's that one? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Lord. To satisfy the law, you must keep the law perfectly in thought, word, and deed every single day of your life, no days off. You may even have a very good day. You know what a very good day looks like? Those are the days when your prayers are answered just like you wanted them to be. When you got ready to leave the work, leave for work, your spouse kissed you good morning. <laughs> the boss gave you a raise when you got to work. <laughs> good day, right? <laughs> well, what about the not so good day? When you got ready to leave for work, your spouse wasn't anywhere to be seen because you're in the doghouse. <laughs> the dog bit you on the way out the front door. <laughs> and then what did I hear you say? Oh, don't say it. You know, one of those days. Do you realize that after that day you are condemned one day? You are condemned by the law and lost. How's your law keeping doing? Let's look at verse 11 and we'll find that Paul is using scripture once again. In verse 10, Paul tells us, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Then in verse 11, he continues, clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. Then Paul is quoting from Habakkuk 2.4 when he writes, the righteous will live by faith. The translation of those words from the original can better be said this way. He who is just by faith shall live. He who is just by faith shall live. I would like to bring to you something that you may not be aware of. You see, the word faith in the Old Testament can also be translated as faithful. And the scribes in Jesus' day gave a different interpretation to Habakkuk 2.4. They put it this way. Those who are faithful shall live. In other words, their faithfulness is what saved them. They turn this grace-filled text, this righteousness by faith text, into righteousness by works, by changing the translation of one word. Habakkuk did not suggest that our faithfulness would save us. It was our faith in our Savior that would save us. Now let's continue in verse 12, and we'll find that the law is not based on faith. Let me put it this way. It is not enough to believe in the law of God. You can come to the law and say, I believe you totally. I believe in all ten of the commandments, not just nine. I believe in the law of God. So does that satisfy the law for your salvation? Not even this much. The law does not care if you believe in it or not. The law demands 
obedience. The law demands perfect obedience, continual obedience, if you're going to go to heaven through your law keeping. Then in verse 12, Paul is again quoting Scripture. And notice that God tells you how the law saved you. Leviticus 18, 4 and 5, and you can follow along in, in your notes. You must obey my laws to be careful to follow and, and be careful to follow my decrees. And then he signs it. I am the Lord your God. Then he goes on. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. Then he signs it again, I am the Lord. The person who obeys them will live. You see, God did enter an old covenant relationship with the Jews. He did. But the reason he did was not because he was going to use that as a method of salvation. God was using that method to bring the Jews under the law that they might discover that they're incapable of meeting the law's demands. So that they would turn to him and accept his plan of salvation that he had made with Abraham 430 years before he gave the law to the Jews. Romans 10, 4 and 5, Christ is the what? What's the word? Culmination. culmination. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. And I want to pause and tell you something very important. When Jesus came to this world, He did not come to save you by bypassing the law. I know what the law says. You know, you guys just can't do it. And so, you know, hey, man, I forgive you. Is that what He did? No. Not at all. And sometimes that's kind of the feeling we get. That, that Jesus somehow just said, oh, you're all right, you're all right. You don't have to worry about it. You know, Jesus met all the requirements of the law on behalf of the human race so that all who believe in him will have a righteousness that fully satisfies the law in the holy history of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are two things that the law requires of each of us. Number one, perfect obedience. Perfect obedience. And because we are sinners, it requires perfect obedience. Justice. In Christ, we have both. Perfect obedience, not yours, his. And perfect justice that you deserved, but he took upon himself. By his perfect obedience, Jesus met the positive demands of the law. And by his death on the cross, he met the justice of the law so that in Christ we have perfect obedience, perfect righteousness that stands up to every scrutiny of the law. Jesus did not bypass the law. He did what you could do. So in verse 4, Paul gives us righteousness by faith. In verse 5, it is contrasted with what Moses said about our standing before the law. Verse 5, Moses writes of this about the righteousness that is by the law. 
The person who does these things shall live by them. I want you to see the difference between these two. I would like to give you three major differences between justification by faith and justification by works of the law. One will be labeled the faith method and the other will be labeled the law method. Three areas where the two are completely opposite so that they can never, ever, ever come together as partners. Faith method number one promises righteousness and life to the believers in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 5 tells us, However, to the one who does not work, but trust God, who justifies the who? The ungodly. Their faith is credited as what? Righteousness. Law method number one promises life only to those who are the doers, those who perfectly obey the law before the law can ever offer you eternal life. Faith method number two depends on God's righteousness which He obtained for us in Christ. Romans 1.17 For in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The faith method saves the person who is depending on God's righteousness, not his own. Law method number two depends on man's righteousness, standing alone before a holy God. How would you like to be that guy? <laughs> standing alone before the throne of God. I've, I like to try and visualize the absolute power that is sitting there on that throne. The power that is holding all of these galaxies and universes, he's holding it there by his might and his power. He created it. He sustains it. And you know, he knows every one of them by name. And he knows you. He knows where you live. And he knows all your problems. Can you imagine? Go way out there in the universe somewhere, and you've seen the pictures. Your, your imagination can do it. Go way out there in the universe somewhere and look down at our galaxy. It's huge. But it's just one of billions and billions. Just one. And, and then you come zooming right down, right to our solar system. We see the sun and the planets running around and all that stuff. And you come down again to the planet Earth and you come right down here to Clarksburg, West Virginia. And sitting right there is Sarah. <laughs> we seem a long ways. I've got all of But just put yourself in that spot. Larry Murphy. There he is. God knows my name. He knows Great. how many pills I take. He knows everything. Everything. But then we come down to Romans 3.10. As it is written... There is no one righteous, not even Larry Murphy. Paul is not telling us that we're not capable of good acts. He's saying that we are not capable of good acts without our selfish motivations getting in the way. That's what he's saying. 
I'm gonna pick on Sarah again. Oh boy. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys it she makes the best muffins in the whole wide world. And I'm not exaggerating. But you know what? Couldn't I be hoping that if I give her a little pat on the back, maybe I'll get some muffins. <laughs> but you understand from the illustration what I'm talking about. When we do good things, way too often it's because we expect something in return. Even from God. God, look what I do. I've been so good today. That's being human. We have our good deeds flavored. Isaiah 64, 6 puts it this way. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. All of our what? All the good things we do. The things that we're so proud of. Even your mama is proud of you. But guess what? They're like filthy rags before a holy God. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. Faith method number three. The faith method justifies the ungodly. <clears throat> Romans 4, 5 again. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. You know, we need to praise the Lord this morning. You know that? God justifies the who? The ungodly. That's me, that's you. Sorry, you know. Law method number three. The law method justifies only the righteous. Only those super perfect ones. I don't know any of those. And as we already saw, there is how many righteous? None. No, not one. You and I must make a choice. And this is the question that I would like to pose to you this morning. What will your choice be? Which method are you going to choose as your way to heaven? The law method? Or the faith method. Please remember, you cannot have some of each. They're mutually exclusive. Have, have you ever heard this? I must do my best, and Christ will do the rest. You ever heard that? It's absolute heresy. I must do my best, me first, then Christ will do the rest. That is a blending of the law method and the faith method. I'm going to keep all of those laws that I possibly can, and when I fall, bang, here comes Jesus. Really? That's not how it works. It's one or the other. It can't be a blending of the two. Galatians 5, verse 4. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from who? Christ. You have fallen away from what? You can't blend the two. It can't be done. You have to make that choice. And only you can make that choice. Folks, the choice is yours. In order to help you make the right choice, I'll give you two passages that throw a little light on the issue. 
This is where Paul is dealing with the Jewish failure and the Gentile success. Here he is addressing the Jews in Romans 9, 30 and 32. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness that is by faith? But the children of Israel who pursue the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Who's the stumbling stone? Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't add in a bunch more of the text. It would have stood out a little better. These verses let us know, as a matter of fact, which method will be successful. We see here that the righteousness that is by faith will be successful in getting us to the promised land, and the righteousness that is by the works of the law will fail miserably to get us where we long to be. The second passage I would like you to consider before making your choice is Philippians 3, 8, and 9. 7 and 8. What is more? I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of mine own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul made the choice from righteousness by works of the law which he had with bells on because he was a Pharisee to the righteousness that comes from God. I'm asking you to make a choice this morning, a choice that will have eternal consequences, a choice that will give you hope of salvation or failure and eventually death. Doesn't seem like much of a choice to me, right? I don't have to really ponder on it very long. <clears throat> but folks, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How about you? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song. <clears throat> 